Originally released in 2007, Paranormal Activity helped popularize the found footage horror craze and went on to spawn a successful franchise that ran until 2015. With the new entry set to be released early next year, it looks like the series isn't quite as over as we had been led to believe. So in this video, we're going to be ranking all six movies in the original Paranormal Activity franchise from the worst all the way to the best. What is up screen team, Zach Cherry here, and if you're all about horror movies and categorizing them into arbitrary lists as much as I am, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and turn on those bell notifications, setting them to all. That way you can get alerts to even more videos just like this one. Just a reminder to everyone that a spoiler warning for the Paranormal Activity franchise is in effect and that the opinions in this video are that of my very own and do not necessarily reflect an objective consensus. I will however be basing my rankings on some specific criteria. One, how entertaining was the movie, for example, were the characters and plot interesting? Two, how scary was it? Did it do a good job? building up suspense and paying that off with frightening set pieces? And three, originality. Was it able to set itself apart as its own unique entry within the franchise? Honestly, there's not a whole lot of any of that to be found across these six movies, as I would probably classify found footage to be one of the weakest devices to have come about in contemporary filmmaking, especially within the horror genre, as you automatically lose out on having any sort of classic mood setting score. Visually, it's mostly just shaky or static handheld cinematics, and and there's not much in the way of scripted dialogue or acting. With that caveat having been said, I actually was more engaged with some of these paranormal chapters than I was with others. So before we find out which ones, be sure to toss this video a thumbs up and drop me a line in the comments down below to let me know what your personal rankings would be of all six paranormal activity movies. Coming in last place is Paranormal Activity The Ghost Dimension. During the Christmas holidays, a young family finds a box of old VHS tapes along with a heavy duty video camera camera, which allows them to see a black liquidy mass that has attached itself to their six-year-old daughter. At the time of its release, the ghost dimension was marketed as being the final installment in the Paranormal Activity franchise, and ended up pissing off a lot of longtime fans who had been clinging on desperately in order to get some kind of closure to the story. Instead, this movie mostly abandons everything that came before it, in order to focus more so on the 3D technology and digital effects that the producers had put $10 million towards. The end result gives us some semi-decent looking CGI, which just feels kind of out of place on handheld camera. In terms of the story, we do get minimal connective tissue in the form of young Katie and Christy showing up in some homemade movies shot by the midwife's coven, but there's really nothing new we learn about any of them here. And the idea of time traveling and the ghost dimension, which was introduced at the end of the previous film, doesn't really get much development either. Furthermore, Furthermore, it makes absolutely no story sense whatsoever that the midwives would plant any sort of evidence in their intended victims' belongings, let alone a device which provides them the wherewithal to know exactly what it is they're up against. And I would forgive this stupid premise, if not for the fact that this movie gives us exactly the same thing as it had before, only somehow less by removing any scary moments or escalating tension. The characters this time around make up my least favorite family of the franchise, where every adult just seems to lack urgency and common sense, and the little girl is your typical stock horror creepy kid. To the filmmaker's credit, there's probably no good way to wrap up a franchise that relies solely on the use of found footage, but there's definitely a better way to do it. I mean, just off the top of my head, you could follow a team of paranormal investigators who are trying to uncover the midwife's coven and locate the missing children. That way, at least you could attempt to answer some questions and avoid the all too familiar your trap of having to establish the same setup all over again, which usually takes up the first 30 minutes of each film. In fifth place is Paranormal Activity 4. A teenage girl starts to notice some weird occurrences in and around her house when a mysterious woman moves in next door with her creepy son. Between this and The Ghost Dimension, these are the two films in this franchise I find to be completely unsatisfying. I do, however, prefer this one because I appreciate the fact that they mostly framed it from the view of a laptop webcam as it allows us to see the characters' reactions and what's going on behind them, which gives us a slight variation from the filming perspective we got in the first three movies. But really, the biggest detriment that drags this one down for me is the ridiculous plot contrivance that sees Katie disappear for most of the movie after a supposed medical emergency so that her creepy demon-possessed spy kid would stay with the main family. First of all, how do they even agree to go along with this? We literally 
see this kid walk up to the house by himself and apparently explain the situation to the parents and without asking any questions or say, I don't know, consulting with the police or the hospital or Katie herself, they just allow for this arrangement to happen. To be fair, Alex's parents are quite possibly the stupidest people in this entire franchise, but what makes absolutely no sense to me is why Hunter slash Wyatt ended up with them to begin with. If the coven's ultimate goal was to get his blood for their ritual, why give him up for adoption when they had already abducted him back at the end of the second movie? This is something that is never addressed, and for this being the first true sequel to the original movie, it could have been literally any story other than the one that didn't even need to exist. I think it would have been way more entertaining if this was set up as a Hitchcock rear window homage, with Katie and Hunter moving in next door to Alex and the whole movie having been her spying on them from her bedroom. I mean, it's a cliche that's been done to death, but for the sake of giving us a coherent and intriguing plot, I would much prefer that than what we got. But even as a sequel to Paranormal Activity, there's not really all that much activity here. We get the levitation bit and the thing with the kitchen knife, but we're not covering any new ground, and the stakes certainly haven't been raised either. I mean, come on, this is old hat for this franchise. All this stuff was done before, and done way better. I also think this chapter has the weakest climax of the whole franchise, as it feels very rushed and ends abruptly. I would say it might have benefited from being drawn out a little more, but given the lack of suspense and overall flat feel, I don't think the extra runtime would have helped all that much. A lot of that has to do with the franchise's style of storytelling by presenting us with more questions, only to have to wait years to possibly get the answers, which maybe works for television, but unfortunately doesn't really satisfy my curiosity enough to really care or want more. In fourth place is Paranormal Activity 2. Primarily set three months before the events of the first movie, Katie's sister and new mom Christy sets up a security system in her family's home after a supposed break-in, which of course begins to capture strange occurrences. I actually enjoyed this movie a lot when I first watched it, but upon this most recent viewing, I found it to be particularly boring. I mean, it's no less like watching paint dry as compared to the lower-ranked movies on this list, but this one in particular seems to take a really long time to pick up any momentum. This movie also suffers from the all-too-convenient cliché of having its characters not simply just showing the irrefutable video evidence to the skeptic in the family, which would have likely resolved a lot of the story's conflict much sooner without having to drag out so much unnecessary and ineffective tension. For example, why is Ali showing her dad a video of the door closing behind her, which he blames on the wind, when literally right after that, the baby was seen floating out of his crib. I also have a lot of issues with the way this movie presents any of the footage. This is being framed as though it's police evidence and has been edited together to show specific points of unexplained phenomenon, yet with six cameras placed in and around the house, so much of what is happening occurs off screen, only to jump immediately to the aftermath. And it's not like the footage is missing or happens off camera, it's just purposefully been excluded, which just comes across as lazy. On top of that, there are a ton of scenes throughout which show one-off interactions or conversations being recorded on handheld camera that realistically would probably never be recorded. For instance, Katie and Christy talking about their childhood trauma. These moments made sense in the first movie as everything was being documented by the characters and they just had the one camera to use, but this time around it probably would have felt more organic to the plot if the same conversation had just been picked up on the security cams while the two were sitting in the living room. However, I suppose having the handheld does make things feel more visually dynamic as opposed to only showing static angles throughout, so it's not a major gripe, just something that kind of takes me out of the experience. Now, for what I like about Paranormal Activity 2 is that it directly relates to the movie that came before it, and quite seamlessly blends the two storylines together. I've never been a fan of many of the characters in this franchise, or have felt particularly sympathetic towards them, but I would say that Ally Ray is probably my favorite protagonist of the ones we got. The tension here, as counterfeit as it is, does progress proportionately as the stakes are raised, and I find the ending to be kind of shocking and disturbing. Mostly, this is a very average, middle-of-the-road entry in this franchise, but other than some confusing action towards the end of the film, this is a relatively easy one to follow. In third place is Paranormal Activity 3, a prequel set in 1988. The story follows a young Katie and Christy as the origins of their demonic hauntings begin, all 
while being recorded by their mom's videographer boyfriend. Stylistically, I do appreciate this one for capturing an authentic 80s aesthetic, as it somehow feels very retro without forcing an oversaturation of iconography that would be typical of that era. It all goes towards making this feel just a little bit more grounded in reality and keeps my attention solely focused on the events as they're unfolding. Of course, there is the glaring plot hole of 80s home video footage turning up in pristine 1080p high def, but we won't pay that too much mind here. I find this entry to be a little more terrifying than most, not that I take too much away from it in that category, as of course it has its fair share of jump scares, but it pulls it off well because it knows how to use misdirection to its benefit and sets those moments up pretty effectively. For that reason, I think this boasts some of the better set pieces of the franchise, if you can call them that. It certainly has a creepy and memorable finale, as we finally see firsthand that our protagonists are not safe even if they leave the house, and amidst a franchise where most of the kills are often obscured, unintentionally hilarious, and confusing, this one probably has the most noteworthy demise, with Dennis getting folded backwards like a lawn chair. It's a pretty cool looking effect that's punctuated even further by that cringy sound design of his spine snapping in half. I'd say this movie is pretty much on par with the second one for me, it just edges it out by a tiny bit because I find it a little more memorable. The problem is that I mostly remember it for how frustrating it is in terms of continuing the mythology of the series. Like I said, these movies tend to raise more questions than they do offer answers, and this chapter is probably the biggest offender for that. Mostly because after already getting a prequel with Paranormal Activity 2, going back even further in time feels a little redundant. As we had just left off on a cliffhanger of sorts, and rather than immediately resolve that issue, we take five steps in the wrong direction. And this wouldn't have been as jarring as it turned out to be, except that most of the events of this prequel really don't justify its existence. Sure, there is some groundwork laid out for Toby and the Midwives Coven, but it also felt like there was a lot more story missing that ended up on the cutting room floor. And sure enough, this was the case, as the trailers were loaded with scenes that were not not even in the movie, which had they been included might have given this some more meat, specifically the scene with the priest or the childhood home going up in flames, and even though we do get that split second frame before the end credits showing the parents bed on fire, done to much better effect in Fight Club by the way, this was the biggest plot thread that had been set up in the first two movies, so it felt like a huge disservice to the audience to relegate it to a mere easter egg. Most of these films on their own, despite their connectivity, can still sufficiently be viewed as a standalone. This one, however, is bolstered by the two entries which preceded, and then entirely dependent on the three entries that follow. So this is kind of the case of Paranormal Activity 3 being an adequate movie in the franchise that becomes retrospectively worse with the diminishing returns of each successive sequel. We do get the most insight into the overall series mythology here, but ultimately it's never paid off in the end, so it's kind of all for naught. In second place is Paranormal activity, The Marked Ones. After a high school graduate's neighbor is murdered by a former classmate of his, he and his friends begin their own investigation into the crime, only to discover a chilling connection he has with the deceased. I will admit, when I initially saw this one in the theater, I was not a fan, and kind of checked out of the franchise at that point. There are a few reasons for that, mainly I had just grown tired of the premise, but also this one was marketed as being a spin-off, rather than being Paranormal Activity 5, something that is very peculiar to me, as this movie answers more questions from the first three movies than the fourth movie does. However, it was on my most recent rewatch of this one that I found it to be pretty good. Granted, I probably needed to view it alongside all of the other movies to realize that, but there are so many things that The Marked Ones does right that the others just failed at. First of all, I love how this one takes you on an adventure. Rather than hanging around one setting for the entire film, we travel with the characters wherever they go, which creates a much more dynamic viewing experience. This is also the only time in the franchise where they don't use the whole numbered night framing device, which previously had posed a very restrictive narrative by relegating all of the action to predictable measured beats. It made sense to have it in the first movie, but with its omission here, the story is given a lot more freedom to step outside of the box. Because of that, there is so much more world building done here, as we start to explore new ideas like the time 
Shrine Portal and get a sense of scope for how imposing the Midwives Coven is, which is exactly the kind of direction a franchise should be moving towards when it's five films in. It's all the more reason why the Ghost Dimension was such a letdown, as they completely abandoned these innovations in order to just go back to the basics. In terms of the characters, these are probably the franchise's most sympathetic, to the point where I actually care about what happens to them. It's also the first and only time that we follow a much younger group, which feels more organic to the idea that they would be documenting this experience. It works as a pretty seamless transition too, as it initially starts off with them recording pranks and stunts to upload to YouTube, which obviously I personally find to be very relatable. This is the only entry in the franchise where Christopher Landon receives both a writing and directing credit, which I think speaks volumes to the quality of the marked ones, as Landon has proven himself time and again to be a filmmaker who has a very good understanding of building characters that his audience can relate to. But the reason why a predominantly younger cast works so well here is because we completely bypass the exasperating cliche of having the skeptical authoritarian. This is another smart omission, which probably shaves off 15 minutes of filler so that our characters can embrace the idea of the supernatural early on, therefore allowing the story to push past the boundaries that are typically set by the stodgy spousal or parental archetype. We also get to see Allie from Paranormal Activity 2, who returns for a brief cameo. And although it doesn't really offer anything in the way of a resolution to her story, she does serve to move the plot forward, so at least she's not simply just there for fans. Fair. I think because I wasn't really sure where they were going with the story, this movie did a much better job of drawing me in as I found the surprises to be both terrifying and rewarding, making this sort of a payoff after having to watch every movie leading up to it. The ending was almost Twin Peaks-esque by design, which I very much appreciated, and for the first time in the franchise I wasn't left feeling fatigued by what I had just watched, but rather genuinely pleased and wanting to see more like this. The marked ones is the most original of all the sequels, and the fact that it's given a Latino perspective and urban setting really gives this its own flavor in a pretty stale franchise. I might actually prefer this one as my favorite, as it definitely has the greatest rewatchability factor for me, but sometimes simplicity is the best foundation for a subversive horror premise, and there is one more movie on this list which is just more deserving of those accolades. And that of course brings us to first place with the original Paranormal Activity. After moving into a new home, a couple starts to experience strange occurrences during the night and soon begin recording themselves sleeping in hopes of capturing the disturbances on video. Shot on a budget of $10,000 US, this would go on to gross $9.1 million in its first week of release, which broke the record of highest grossing weekend ever for a movie playing at less than 200 theaters. Similar to The Blair Witch Project, this found footage darling made waves very quickly through word of mouth and saw a resurgence that repopularized the format, paving the way for a slew of really bad knockoffs. Looking back on Paranormal Activity today, it's not all that special. I certainly didn't find it to be scary upon my most recent viewing, but that doesn't mean that it didn't elicit that kind of reaction from me the first time I ever watched it. In fact, the scariest thing to me ever is watching YouTube videos about similar unexplained encounters of demonic possession, which result in mysterious deaths and disappearances. Had this actually been based on a true story or had depicted actual raw footage from a crime investigation, watching this would have chilled me to the bone. However, like most breakout horror hits, the level of terror became so desaturated with the film's growing popularity and necessity to turn it into a full-fledged franchise that it got to a point where it could no longer be masqueraded as true found footage. If this were a standalone film, I think it could have retained its air of mystique, but for the sake of this ranking video, I can only judge this movie based on its own merits, and for that I still think this was a genius and influential piece of horror history for its time. Despite the film's cinematic shortcomings, writer-director Oren Pelly still takes advantage of telling a story through escalating tension and creating dread and conflict in the absence of any tangible presence or comprehensible action. In order for that to all work so effectively, it adopts a less is more mentality, which even if you absolutely hate hate because you require constant stimulation, you have to acknowledge the fact that filmmaking is not bound by any one clear-cut medium and that this is quite transcendent for what it is. I want to thank my Patreon supporter Johnny Nash. If you guys enjoyed this ranking video, you can check out this playlist for some of the other franchises
exercises I've done. Until next time, I've been Zach Cherry, and I'll be right back.